Okay, so what we're doing today's lecture is upon the integrated and differential equations of rate law. We've been dealing primarily with the rate equation R equals K times a concentration of one reactant to some power times another reactant to some power. Okay, this is good information. It tells us at initial conditions of A and B what the rate will be. Okay, assuming you know the value of your K, your rate law constant. Okay, now that is great, but it only tells us what the initial rate is from the initial concentration. So this doesn't give us a lot of information because very rarely are we ever at the start of reaction. It's great to know how much the rate will be at the start of reaction, but man, there are plenty of time periods during the course of a reaction where we might want to know exactly how much time it's going to take for reactant A to get to a certain concentration, okay, or how much, okay, or when the time will be when A loses its concentration enough or loses its effectiveness, or how much time does it take to deplete one of the other. So there's plenty of questions that occur beyond the initial point. And to go there, we're going to have to get into a little bit of calculus uh, and, and make a differential equation and eventually uh, integral to tie the um, concentration over some time period, okay, to a change in concentration. So we know that very simple a derivative, as you guys have already learned from a function, this being f of x, okay, we know that a derivative is some time period. It's and it's a very small. We you guys have been using dx because x is your x-axis. So it's a differential equation or a derivative is nothing more than evaluating the derivative of this function, which represents dx. Now, this dx is a differential value of x, if you haven't already learned that. That means that we're talking about basically two points, a point here and, let's say, a point here. That's pretty big space. And to take an average of those two points wouldn't give you great data in terms of where we actually are in terms of the exact uh, value. The f of x could be the concentration of A. Okay, so what a differential is, as you guys know, it's pretty, pretty much making very small distances between two points and making that limit go to zero so that you really have, okay, a point right on that line. And you know exactly what that slope is, okay, at that point time and t uh, that time okay so that's interesting and it's helpful to take this rate law and evaluate into a differential equation but that's not enough okay it's not enough to know a derivative derivative is just going to give me the change okay my d of a okay we'll say over the dt okay D the differential of A over the differential of T, meaning for those that haven't taken calculus, that means some span of A. So we take a point on the y-axis, and we take two points, but we make those points go to zero, and essentially we're taking one point. So we want to know the change of Y over change of X, so to speak, and this gives us a slope of where we're headed. But it doesn't give me the value, okay, all right, underneath this curve and that's what we're really after we want to know some value okay of some rectangles underneath this curve to evaluate a over time it, so uh, that's what derivative will give me a point okay um, and of time but we want to know between different time periods which means we're going to need to know this area under the curve what's happening with my changes of concentration of a over time so we need to go forward beyond a differential equation into something called an integral. Now, some people call integrals as nothing more than the antiderivative. We go backwards. But really, this is like an S for the sum. It's for the sum of basically points between some kind of spread between, um, let's say, uh, concentration uh, of some A over A naught. A naught would be some initial concentration. And we take basically this area under the curve we take these differentials and we basically take a bunch of inter differentials and add up all these rectangles to an infinite amount to get the total area which will evaluate 
okay, how A is changing over time. And we can actually figure out over a time period, over a change of T, infinite amount of these little rectangles or differentials, we can add them all up, the sum of the differentials, and we can actually evaluate the value of A at, between two temperatures, um, two, te two time periods, or get what A is at a time period, okay, which is important information. So if you haven't seen these things, that's what I'm deriving today. And for me, math really took off for me in college when I saw how this related. So it's interesting enough. Now, we're going way beyond the scope, but I want to show you where these laws come from so you get a good feeling for them. So we're going to start with a first order reaction, okay? A first order reaction is R is equal to rate law constant so, so to some uh, reactant to the zero order, okay? Now, we know that really equals 1. So R is really equal to K because anything to the zero order is 1, okay? We know that that's not going to affect the rate law constant. So R is equal to K, and that's one value of R. But we can look at R another way. We can say the rate is equal to the negative change of A as it disappears over the change of time. And I should put brackets around here. That's another way to look at that. And we look at this through stoichiometric relationships. And I can make these equal to each other. And I could say, and I'm going to flip them for my own purposes. I kind of like it over here. So I'm going to make negative A change of the concentration of A, all right, and of course this is a little A0, this is initial concentration because initial concentrations are written here, and I'm going to put that over change of T, and that equals, of course, K. So I set these equal to each other, and this is called a differential equation. Uh, derivatives and differential equations, for those that are going to get into this, really link relationships and equations together to get bigger relationships. That's what really derivatives and differential equations do. They allow you to connect different formulas and relationships into a larger scope, okay? Uh, and that's really cool if you get into that. Now, let's continue here. Let's make this a differential or a derivative, okay? So what we're going to do is d of a0, okay, the differential of a0. Now you guys would go over dx, okay? We're going to use dt because my x, when I'm evaluating the change of concentration over time, okay, we actually use, instead of dx, dx, dt, or whatever, we, the, our, our, our dt is our time period, okay, and of course, this is our k. All right, so I'm going to move this dt over, and that's going to give me, let's scroll, scroll this down, sorry about that, scroll this down, that's going to give me, okay, da naught which is initial concentrations, okay, equals KDT, okay, and that's my differentiated equation in terms of a derivative, okay, and I'm actually finding points, and that's all nice stuff here, but like I said before, I want to find the area under the curve for this change of A from A0 to, to evaluate and link time T uh, time and concentration, amount of concentration. See, the derivatives, okay, will give us the slope on the function to see where we're headed, but it's not going to give me information about what's ahead. That's very important. If I have a function going down, a derivative gives me a time, uh, a, you know, a differential of two points that are static, so to speak, even though they're really two points limiting to zero. But an integral will link this point to this point using these added up little squares or differentials, the sum of all those differentials. That's why we need an integral. We don't want a point. We want to, we want to be able to link the amount of concentration that changes over time. Okay, and that's pretty cool if you understand that. So we do an integral, okay, and it looks like this. An integral looks like the sum, and we're going to go, for, in this case, from the concentration of the A over some time period, sometimes we put a T there, but I'm just leaving it as A, to from the A0 position, okay? And of course, this is evaluated by time. I put the K outside because it's a constant already, okay? I don't, it's not going to do anything. So you'll see T to T0. And then, of course, you know, if you haven't seen integrals in the solution, 
the solution to that is basically adding up all these integrals or coming up with a function that represents adding all these differential little squares in between here to get that value over a time period. Okay, so what we get here is we get, when we solve for this, we get, well, of course, this is going to equal, okay, uh, derivative of, well, the integral of d of a is going to give me uh, basically a of zero, okay, or I should say a minus the constant, okay. In any case, what it looks like, and I'll change my ink because I can, all right, and if you haven't been up this far, it's okay. I'll just kind of follow along here. So I'm going to get some a minus a naught equals, okay, negative kt. Now, of course, I forgot my negative. Negative was here. We brought the negative to this side, and that's where the negatives came from. And that is my first order integrated equation. All it is is a solution from this integral, okay? I'm probably not savvy enough to try to try to explain the mathematics because uh, I'm doing the best I can. I'm a little, little weak in my calculus these days, but I'm getting, I, the basics are very, very important. So there's some rules here to go from this. So what we're doing is evaluating from A0 to some point, and the solution to get this type of area on the curve is you take your A, which means some point beyond A0, which is our constant here, okay, equals negative kt. The, the integral of dt is just the t, okay, just like this is here. Okay, now... Well, how do I use this? Well, let's clean this up a little bit. This becomes A of some concentration over time, okay, minus A0, but I'm going to put that minus over here, so that equals negative KT plus A of 0. And by doing that, okay, I have just created a linear equation. Y equals MX plus B. If I was to graph, okay, my A, okay, over, this is mx, time is my x, look at my k as my slope, that's a negative k, and it's a linear line, and it's a negative, okay, so my negative slope's going down, and my slope is equal to k, or negative k, and there is a graph, and so why are we graphing? We're graphing because we can evaluate a first, a zero, first, or second order equation by graphing the concentration over time. If it goes down in a linear fashion, okay, it is a zero order. There's another graph, and you can evaluate it this way. The rate of a zero order, okay, looks like this. Okay, and the, you notice the k stays the same. It's a constant, R equals K. So during the reaction rate, R equals K, and the, the value, and this is over time, so my rate stays constant for some time period, okay? Obviously, the, it will change as you run out the other reactants that are part of the rate law. Now, example of zero-order reactions are uh, photochemical reactions that require light. For instance, photosynthesis, as we talked about, as I talked with Brian about from some point in time, that, my friends, is a zero-order reaction you have to have the amount of light. The amount of reactants doesn't spark the reaction at all. It's the amount of light. So that's a zero order. Okay, so those are important for zero order. I'm going to have two more lectures define first and second order as we go. Now I have to leave, pick up my son, so you have to wait for the second and third. Okay, but these equations are important. If you look in your reference table, you don't have this one. You're going to have the one I'm going to derive in the second and third video, and it's important lectures that I make, we walk in tomorrow, so you're going to have to wait a little bit for the second and third that you know what those values are. Uh, you're able to take the, these graphs and identify through experimental evidence if it's first or second order. And if you look in your reference table, okay, and I'll give you a peek at that right now, since I'm not sure if I'm going to get to deriving the rest of them through the calculus. I'd love to, but I'm just going to talk about how we can do that. So let's go to uh, the reference table. Okay, the reference table would be somewhere where I don't have open, of course. So let's go to honor uh, AP Chem and let's go to my reference tables. 
And let me show you where they're listed, okay? Because uh, I like to do that. So uh, here I come, and it is on, the, I believe, the first page uh, of where other ones, okay? And it is, there they are. Okay, I'm going to derive the other two. It's funny they don't put the zero order on there, but here it is, okay, in all of its glory. Okay, this is the first order integrated equation. Here is the second. This one we're not using it. This is the Arrhenius equation. So these are the equations we will use, okay? They give different graphs, okay? And I will show you them in a second. This is a first order equation. This is the natural log of the concentration over time minus the natural log of some concentration uh, from current conditions or the what the what you start at okay and this is the second order and the reason why they're different is because of that exponent and how you integrate that okay and they give off different graphs and let me show you those graphs so here are some graphs zero order as I just showed you okay the this is this concentration of a is a linear line First order, you get a you get a lin of a versus time as a straight line. Now you may say, well, how do I know that? Okay, how can I remember? How can I know that or memorize that? Well, if you look at your um, equation for first order that I did not derive yet. Okay, let's go back a second. Let's go to first order, and I can can uh, second order, first order, and I end this show. As I'm showing the slide, okay, this is the first order. Okay, now this says what? Okay, this is my y equals mx plus b. Let me get rid of this. Delete. So first order reaction, as written, it's written like this, but you can put the net. It really means what? Lin of at or lin of uh, at minus a zero. That goes over this side, and this is your y intercept and you get a straight line. So that's how that works. So that so you can use this. So you get a so if it's lin of a okay over t gives you the straight line. Whereas um, if you look at second order okay, second order this is your y now. This is the solution to the integral of a second order. It's a little different because you're going to have that square and again I didn't have time to derive that. Um, there's derivations all over the place, but I, maybe tonight I will, okay? And you look at the uh, 1 over, okay, AT gives you a positive value, okay, for KT. Notice if it's not a second order, it gives you something other than a straight line. So if you get a straight line for the solution of the integrated formula using this as your Y, this is 1 over AT for second order, you've got a second order reaction. If you've got a um, first order reaction, your equation is different. The first one is there, okay? And this is your slope, and you get a negative slope. Your B is your lin of A. You notice it's lin of A. 1 over A is for second order will give you a straight line, but the lin of A over time for straight line represents the curve for the uh, solution or proving the f it's a first order. So back to where I was, and I'm going to end this. I want you to get this. Zero order, like I showed you and proved to you, A over time gives you a straight line. These guys don't. First order gives you a straight line of lin of A over time. And of course, 1 over A gives you a straight line here. Okay? We're going to leave it at that. If I have the other two, I'll add to those.